Hey everyone, welcome to Clear Creek at Home. I'm Josh, one of the ministers here at Clear Creek. So glad that you're joining us all here this morning, coming into your home, maybe your car, or at the airport if you're waiting to travel to or from. Again, we love you. We are so glad that we get to be a part of this moment together. This is the last Sunday in 2021, and it has been an unusual year to say the least. But one thing that has been very consistent is that our God is on the throne. He's always been on the throne. And not COVID, not government, not friendships, not health, nothing has taken him off the throne. And so today we're celebrating Jesus Christ as a church family. And we're just glad that you are a part of it. Now, let me tell you what we're going to do for the next few minutes. Very simply, we're going to sing some songs together, praising Jesus for who he is. Second, you're going to hear three different ministers share just a very brief uh, little vignette, if you will, of a different person who interacted with Jesus after he was born and see from their perspective how he makes such a big difference. And then at the end, we are going to take communion as a family, remembering the cost as well as the gift that Jesus gave. Now, before we get into any of that, two quick things. First off, I got to tell you, tomorrow, Monday, the office is closed. We're taking holiday, hope you are as well. Second though, next Sunday, we're gonna be back together in person, January the 2nd to kick off 2022, and it's going to be a praise and prayer focused time, and I'm having a very special guest speaker with us next week. Don't worry, I'll be here as well, but you're gonna get to hear from someone else. It's gonna be a great Sunday as we kick off the new year. But as we begin this morning, would you pray with us? Holy God, we celebrate you. Jesus, you are our king. You are the one who gives meaning to this life. You are the hope of the world. You are love incarnate. You are the joy that goes beyond circumstances and you bring peace as the prince of peace into this world. And today we celebrate you as Lord of our lives. Join us wherever we are as the God who is in every place and every space. Enter our homes, our cars, the airport terminals. Be with us, not only in our spaces, but Lord, would you meet us in the deepest needs of our hearts this morning? We have so many family who just desperately need to know that they are not alone, and I would ask that you would be close to them in a tangible way. As we sing songs and hear stories and take communion, may your presence be felt here, around the city, and around this world. As we end this year and step into the new one, we join hands with you, dear Jesus. It's in your name we pray, amen. Now, we're going to take just a quick moment. I do want you to say hi, whether it's with family, or even better yet, go ahead and say hi in the chat or text a friend. You've got 30 seconds. stand no legacy survive unless the lord does raise the house in vain as builders strive to you who boast tomorrow's gain tell me what is your life a mist that vanishes at dawn all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. His will be done. His kingdom come on earth as is above. Who is himself our daily bread? Praise him, the Lord of love. Let living water satisfy the thirsty without price. We'll take a cup of kindness yet. All glory be to Christ. All glory. 
King, all glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing, all glory be to Christ. When on the day the great I am, the faithful and the true, Our steadfast light, and we shall ere his people be. All glory be to Christ, all glory be to Christ our King, all glory be to Christ, his rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. Bless the Lord of my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. So sometime after Jesus' birth, he met up with the Magi. Now, if you're, familiar, if you're familiar with Christmas season, you're familiar with the Magi. Sometimes we call them wise men, sometimes we call them kings. Uh, they're all the same people in Scripture. But there's a couple misconceptions about the Magi. First of all, they weren't kings. We sing this song, We Three Kings of Orient Are. Uh, that, that's not what they were. They weren't kings. They were Magi. And Magi, they were into magic, astrology, and astronomy. So they weren't necessarily kings. And second misconception, we often think they were there at the birth of Jesus. But they weren't there at the birth of Jesus. They were, they were more than likely there about a year or two after. And the third misconception is we often say that there were three of them, but there were very likely more than three. Uh, we, we often just say three because they brought the three gifts. 
But now I want to share something that is definitely true about the Magi. This is coming from the book of Matthew. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. And about that time, some wise men, or Magi, from the eastern islands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his stars at rose, and we have come to worship him. And then he goes on to say, The Magi went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, have you ever been window shopping before? It's whenever you go to the mall or a store or something like that, and you see the stuff that's on display, and you admire it, and you like it, uh, but you don't really buy it. You don't really commit to buying it. Uh, maybe you've done this on Amazon, right? You go to uh, all the pages you like, you look up the thing that you might want to buy, and you, and you look at it, you, you kind of get a feel for it, but you don't really commit to actually purchasing the item. I feel like some of us maybe have been doing this with Jesus, and, and it's likely Probably a lot of us did this over the Christmas season. Uh, you came to maybe a Christmas Eve service, you lit the candle, you sang some songs, uh, but you didn't really commit to Jesus. But when we see the Magi, that is not what they did. It says they bowed down and they worshipped him. Now this word worship here, it actually means two different things. One, it means to give a kiss to someone's hand. And two, it means to bow your head with your forehead placed to the ground. Now think about those two pictures. First, you have a kiss. A kiss is a show of emotion. So when it comes to worship, it means involving your emotion with Jesus, to be wrapped up emotionally in worship. And then secondly, they bow down with their heads to the ground. This is a, a dramatic display of action, right? It means that they are wrapping their life up in worship to Jesus. That's so different than window shopping. Now, my question is, are you a window shopper or a worshiper of Jesus? I'm a minister, and I'll be the first to admit, I very often fluctuate between the two, window shopper versus worshiper. But that's my question for you today. Are you window shopping or are you worshiping? There is an endless song Echoes in my soul I hear the music ring And though the storms may come I am holding on And to the rock I cling How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. I will lift my eyes in the darkest night, for I know my Savior lives, and I will walk with you, knowing you'll see me through, and sing the songs you give. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing.
the Bible tells us about a man by the name of Herod. Now, Herod was a king, also known as Herod the Great. We're not totally sure whether it was history that gave him that title or if he gave it to himself, which honestly, hopefully it was the former because nobody really wants to hang out with a guy named Herod the Great if he named himself that. Regardless, you don't get to keep a name like Herod the Great without doing some pretty great things. And Herod honestly did. He was a very powerful king. In fact, during his kingship, he ruled over four different districts, which at the time was kind of unheard of. In fact, when he died, those districts were divided among three different people. But not only was Herod powerful, but he used his power to keep the power that he had. And one of the biggest ways he did that was to curry favor with different people groups, especially inside the city of Jerusalem. So he launched building and housing projects. He did things to stimulate the economy. Uh, in fact, he also helped rebuild the Jewish temple so that the Hebrews had a place to worship. So, so much of what Herod did as king was simply to keep the power that he had. And that brings us to our story in Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw a star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Now, it's not really difficult to figure out why Herod was disturbed. You have these foreigners coming in literally to the seat of his power saying, hey, where is the king of the Jews? Because we want to worship him. Now, to be fair, Herod's literal title was Herod, king of the Jews. So to say that he was disturbed is probably a pretty massive understatement. And so you can kind of see like the wheels turning in his head, like what in the world am I going to do with this? How can I fix this problem? And then light bulb goes off. Now, by then, Herod had surmised that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which was actually only like five miles from where he was. And so this was his reply to the wise men in verse eight. He said, go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. Now, even if this is the first time you're hearing this story, it is not hard to figure out that no, Herod did not want to go and worship Jesus. In fact, he wanted to get rid of Jesus. He wanted to kill him because he was a huge threat to his power. But something that Herod didn't realize, in fact, many people during that time didn't realize at all, was that Jesus was not the kind of king they thought he came to earth to be. Jesus wasn't interested in territories or, or power or overthrowing governments. Jesus simply wanted to be the king of our lives. He didn't want a throne um, in the sense that we have here on earth. He wanted our hearts. He simply just wanted us. And so that begs the question, are you okay with Jesus being the king of your life? And I think for many of us, right, that's, that's an easy thing to say until the alarm clock goes off and then we <laughs> hit the snooze button 15 times. Instead of getting up like we were supposed to, to spend some time with God, study God's word. So can he really be the king of our life if he's not the king of our time? What about when our parents or our spouse or even our boss ask us to do something that, well, we know we're supposed to do, but we really, really don't want to. So instead of responding with respect and, and with grace, we use that, you know, that doctoral degree that we have in sarcasm um, as a response instead. But can Jesus really be the king of our life if he's not the king of our relationships? Or how about the one that everyone loves to talk about? Money, right? We know that every good and perfect gift comes from God. The Bible tells us that, and we believe that until that good and perfect gift comes in the form of a very hard-earned paycheck. And so we think, why does the first have to go to God? Why can't it go to what I want it to go to first? But can he really be the king of our life if he's not the king of our money? Now, nobody's going to go and accuse us of trying to get rid of the authority of Jesus in the same way that Herod did. But just by ignoring the authority of Jesus in our lives, honestly, the result is the same, and that's we remain the king of our lives, and that Jesus is not. So again, the big question is, are we okay with Jesus being the king of our life? And if so, what are we going to do to make sure he remains the king? You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all.
seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. G, taking my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Welcome back. And again, Evan, Michael, thank you both for sharing. We have one more little picture I want to walk you through, one more snapshot of a life touched by this newborn Jesus. And what happened in that moment utterly shifted and blessed a man who had for so many years been waiting on the promises of God. We're introduced to a man in Luke chapter 2 by the name of Simeon who had been waiting for a very special moment. And this is what Scripture says in Luke chapter 2 beginning in verse 25. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly awaiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. So we go on to learn that this man named Simeon for some time has been waiting, and he's been promised by the Holy Spirit of God that he would not die until he met the Messiah. By the way, what an incredible promise to know that you wouldn't die before seeing the one who will save your soul and save your people. And so Simeon is there in the temple when this young couple walks in. We know that they have just had the delivery. Mary may still be a little swollen and sore, and you've got Joseph who's walking with her, and they're carrying this little bundle of joy. Can you imagine the moment with me? What it, it must have looked like. And there's this thing that happens. I don't know if the Holy Spirit maybe tapped him or prompted him in some way, but something happens because when he sees them, he goes, that's one. He perks up, he goes quickly over to them, and he snatches the baby, which that is bold, Cotton Right? He grabs the baby, and in Luke chapter 2, verse 29, this is what Simeon says, sovereign Lord. By the way, that word sovereign simply means he's in control of everything. Friend, God is in control. Your finances, the relationships, the economy, nothing else trumps the power of God. Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you've promised. Why? I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, friends, do you notice it's not just for the select? It's not for the varsity Christians or the people who have their lives cleaned up who seem to have it all together, but he came for all of us. He came here for you today. He is the God of the nations and he is the glory of your people, Israel. Now remember, we only have 10 verses to get a picture of this one man's life This one man's heartbeat, this one man's desire. See, Simeon has been waiting his whole life for something. And what I love about this, even though it's only 10 verses, I see myself in Simeon. And I'm guessing that you probably do as well, because isn't it true we are all from time to time waiting for something? We're looking for something. We're longing for something. And I was just thinking about this week. Simeon Simeon was waiting for the Messiah. He was waiting for God's rescuer. 
And in these 10 verses, we get to see the fruition, the fulfillment of God's promise, Jesus, the light of the world. And so here's my question for you this morning. What are you waiting for today? I I would guess that some of us are waiting for that job interview, that new opportunity to get the go ahead that you have been selected because all your problems will be solved, everything will be better is what we think, right? Or maybe you're not waiting for a job, you're waiting for Mr. or Mrs. Wright, someone who, as the silly phrase goes, completes you. Or maybe it's not Mr. Wright, maybe it's not a new job, but it's just a college acceptance letter. You're ready, because if you can get into that one school, okay, maybe that 10th school, everything will be better. Or maybe it's not school, maybe you're just waiting for your spouse to stop drinking. Or maybe you're waiting this week of all weeks to get the results of that test. And you're just hoping for good results. See, the reality is every one of us here, wherever you are, we are all waiting for something. And Simeon is waiting for the one thing that can fix all things. Because here's the reality, and and just can I be frank with you? The one thing you're waiting for, if it's any of the things that I've just mentioned or myriad others, any of the things that I just mentioned, will not ultimately fulfill you. They won't fix what's going on because here's the reality. If you get the job of your dreams, your dreams are gonna change and you're gonna want a different job eventually, aren't you? If you do find Mr. or Mrs. Wright, you are married, things are good, and I pray if that's your desire that God will give you the desire of your heart. But here's the reality. It doesn't matter who you marry. That person will never fulfill all your needs. If you get into school, that's exciting and we hope you do, but the excitement will fail and it will fade away. And if your spouse, by the grace of God, turns their life around, that spouse still cannot fulfill all the needs that you have. And if you get the test results back and everything's good, isn't it true that so many of us, we then just go to the next thing to worry about? So even the things that we think, if we get them, everything will be better. The one thing we're waiting for, if it's anything other than for Jesus, it will let us down. But here's the great news. And what Simeon shows us in just 10 verses is the one thing that you and I desperately need, and many of us may not even know it, the one thing that we're waiting for came 2,000 years ago. And he is the one, Jesus Christ, according to Scripture, is the wisdom of God. So, friend, you need wisdom today. Jesus is the answer to that need Scripture says that Jesus is not simply the wisdom of God. He's the peace of God, the prince, the ruler, as we talked about this past week. If you need peace, he's the one. He is the joy of God, bringing joy to people. He is the love of God. If you need love, he is the answer. He is the hope, meaning there is more than what you've seen or heard or experienced. In other words, what you need more than anything else is what has already been offered. And so let me ask you again. What are you waiting for? What are you longing for? Are you like Simeon today saying, if I could just see a picture of God, I can get through the next season? Because anything other than for Jesus will not sustain you in the next year. But here's my promise, because it's the scripture's promise. Jesus Christ will never fail you or let you down. And if you'll accept him, this next year may be your best year yet. Not because everything's fixed, but because Jesus is with you. And so one of the cool things we get to do as believers in Christ every Sunday is celebrate the fact that God is with us, that we are with him, that we have been merged into one, which is a wild idea, but that's part of what communion shows us. Uh, If you're a guest with us, maybe joining this broadcast because someone said, hey, you should, awesome. Here's what we're about to do. We're about to take a little piece of bread. Now, this bread doesn't have any magic power. It's not sacred or holy. In fact, it's kind of stale, just to be real honest with you. (laughs) Yeah, truth. But it symbolizes something that does not ever grow stale. And that's the power and the presence of your Savior and my Savior, Jesus Christ. Scripture teaches that he, his body was literally torn apart so that you and I would not have to suffer for our sins. So we're gonna take this, and we're also gonna take a little bit of grape juice, and this juice symbolizes the blood that Jesus shed or spilled, that it was poured out, and it was like this, this waterfall of grace that if you'll step under his cleansing power, you are constantly being cleansed and made new. You're the Teflon person where sin no longer gets to stick to you, and your guilty conscience can be made clean, not only in your own eyes, but more importantly, before God. And so today, as we take these blessed emblems I would invite you to consider, what are you waiting for? Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for Jesus, the one who came, the one who lived, loved, died on our behalf, rose on the third day, ascended to you, and now, as Scripture says, he is (laughs) preparing a place for us. And all we get to do now is in eager anticipation, live each moment in the reality that what we need has already been given. So we take this bread and this juice. We celebrate you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray, amen. Take and eat. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood. I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you. I'm in awe of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white. I owe all to you. I owe all to you, Jesus. There's a place where sin and shame are Forgiveness, where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down at the cross, at the cross, I surrender. Arms open wide here, you save my life, here I bow down, here I bow at the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life, I'm in all with you. Worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father.
glory. Let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of love. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. Sing your praise, praise to the Father, praise, praise to the Father, praise, praise to the Father of glory. Sing your praise, praise to the Father, praise, praise to the Father, praise, praise to the Father of love. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. Lift your hands to the Father, hands to the Father, to the Father of glory. Lift your hands to the Father, hands to the Father, hands to the Father of love. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. Thank you for joining us online for this service. We hope that you have a happy holiday and a great new year. We'll see you later.